Welcome, bienvenidos to today's core training on preparing a program budget and budget narrative. I'm Nicole Lezen. I'm one of the local consultants who facilitates a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based or Core Investments, along with Nicole Young. We're your host today. And we're also joined by our colleague, Crystal Caballero, who many of you have met through prior training and uh, TA sessions. Welcome everyone. As you can hear, today's session is held in English with Spanish interpretation. Gisela Carrasco, whose voice you're hearing now, is providing consecutive interpretation and will also translate your written comments and questions in the chat. Soon we'll switch to simultaneous interpretation, which is provided by Stella Lauerman. I'll turn it over to Nicole Young, who's going to give us an overview of CORE and some details about the RFP. Thanks, Nicole. So again, CORE stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments. And so we think of it as both a funding model and a broader effort or movement to achieve equitable health and well-being for all people across the lifespan in Santa Cruz County. And through a number of collaborative uh, discussions and efforts, CORE has really evolved over several years um, and led to this core mission and vision statement that you see on the screen with equity at the center. And when we say things like equitable health and well-being, we mean that all people across the lifespan need to have equitable opportunities to experience these eight interdependent core conditions for health and well-being, meaning that people's opportunities and their life outcomes aren't predictable for better or for worse by things like race, ethnicity, income, gender identity, sexual orientation, uh, and so on. So when we talk about core as both a funding model and a movement, it really provides us a framework to align our priorities and programs, our policies, our funding, and our results around a set of community-wide goals, and then work together to create those core conditions for health and well-being. And we keep equity at the center, and we're going to uh, mention it several different times throughout this training, as well as other TA sessions, um, because we use this, um, uh, you know, our diagram of the core conditions to really illustrate that we have to examine and address our individual and our organizational and systemic beliefs and practices and structures that are often the things that perpetuate or hold in place the inequities that we're trying to eliminate. And so very uh, directly connected to that is the County of Santa Cruz's equity statement, which the Board of Supervisors adopted uh, fairly recently, and it's this is also mentioned in the core investments request for proposals. So we just want to highlight it here and and suggest like really pay attention to the the words in this statement, particularly the phrases that are in bold. So that as you're preparing your application, you can kind of do that mental check to see is what you're describing does it seem aligned with? Does it really speak to the county's equity statement? And then on the next slide, you'll see the definition of equity, which is included in the glossary of the core RFP. So that's on this slide here. So again, really uh, you know, taking note of some of those phrases like freedom from bias or favoritism, addressing the needs of specific populations most likely to be affected by inequities by providing resources and opportunities so that they thrive. And then just a few words about kind of what today's training, uh, how, the, how it fits into CORE. Um, we offer a variety of trainings and technical assistance as part of the CORE Institute for Innovation and Impact, which really we think of it as the learning arm of CORE investments, uh, where we're really trying to build shared knowledge and shared language and capacity across all different sectors uh, and work towards building those, you know, the knowledge and skills and systems needed to fulfill the collective vision of an equitable, thriving, resilient community. And then, as you all know by now, uh, the county and city released their core investments request for proposals or RFP on June third, so a little over a month ago. And applications are due on are, are due on August second, so a little less than a month from now. 
You can find the RFP on the county's website, the General Services Department page. This is how you'll know it's officially been posted or changed. Um, there have been, if you go to that uh, website, and Giselle will post the link in the chat in a moment, I believe, yes. Uh, you'll actually see that the county did publish uh, two addendums on June 27th, June 27th and July 3rd. They're fairly minor changes, but that is the place where you find the latest information. Um, HSD has also set up a web page specifically for this current funding cycle, this new RFP. Um, that one contains a lot of information. It's kind of your one-stop shop for all the information and documents that you need related to this RFP. The next slide, we, uh, you'll see several of the key dates leading up to the application due date. Um, so a couple of things to note, the, the deadline to submit questions to that core funding email address, that, that has already passed, uh, it passed on July 1st, and the county has already posted uh, its questions and answers in two documents um, or two different times on June 21st and July 8th. So I'll, I'll uh, say in a moment how you can find the latest um, set of answers to questions that were submitted. In several other trainings, we uh, covered different parts of the application and provided tips and resources about how to go about responding to some of those, knowing that in this RFP, the board and the city council have prioritized specific core conditions and impact statements in lifelong learning, thriving families, and healthy environments. The um, funding for uh, the stable, affordable housing and shelter core condition, many of you have already heard that will be handled through a separate process. We still don't have any details about that. And um, we are actually getting towards the end of our training and technical assistance that we're offering during the uh, core RFP application process. Uh, we have today's training and then one more training this Friday, which is kind of a highlights of all the previous trainings that we've done for the RFP, kind of an, and in case you missed it, <laughs> get some highlights and quick tips. Um, we have finished offering the open office hours, which were kind of the informal opportunities to come with any questions you had. Um, so we have finished with those. And now we are focusing on making sure that um, everybody who wants that individualized technical assistance has had the opportunity um, to do that. So we are um, still taking signups. We uh, had been encouraging everyone to sign up for their first TA session uh, by July 8th. And so that we would have plenty of time to offer the second TA session to every applicant. Um, if you have not yet signed up for TA, you can still use the form um, that Giselle just posted in the chat. Uh, still fill out your, your name and your organization and enough details so that we can follow up with you to see uh, how we can fit you into the TA schedule. Okay, on to the fun stuff now. We are going to launch a brief poll just to get a sense of what your experience is with budgets, because that is the focus of today's training. So tell us what your level of experience is preparing budgets. Would you say it's none, you are completely new to this? Would you say it's some, you've dipped your toe in, or it's a lot of experience, it's part of your job and you've prepared multiple budgets? Uh, or would you say it's, it's extensive, it's all that you do? So we'll give it a few more seconds just to see if any more responses come in. And it looks like we may have slowed down here in the responses. So I'm gonna close the poll in three, two, one. Okay, I'm gonna end it and then let's take a look at this. Okay, so most of you are saying you have a lot of experience It's part of your job and you've prepared multiple budgets. So that's great. And we welcome any um, insights or other tips that you'd like to share with uh, other participants here about 
uh, preparing budgets for grants. But we have kind of a range here in terms of um, some that are saying no experience and some and extensive. So we will draw on the experience in this group here. And so moving on to take a look at our agenda for today, we will um, take a look at the questions in the RFP or in the application that are specifically related to the program budget and leveraging funds. And then Nicole will actually walk us through the templates and, and kind of talk about um, tips for even just approaching how you develop grants for, for budgets or how you develop budgets for grants and how you develop your budget narratives, uh, and then kind of show like some of the examples that are in the templates that the county provided. So let's take a quick look at the specific parts in the RFP having to do with um, budgets and leveraging. Um, so this slide here just shows all the sections of the application that you have to respond to and then the number of points assigned to each of those sections so that you know kind of, you know, the relative weight of um, the, you know, again, the points assigned to those particular parts of the application. So what we're covering today specifically are the program budget and the bonus points for leveraging uh, if you're applying in either tier one or tier two. We do uh, want to remind or just suggest uh, to everyone, you'll see on the next slide, just the um, kind of the high level view of the scoring scale or that scoring rubric. Uh, we didn't include all the definitions of uh, each of those points in this rubric and, and what they mean, but we just really encourage everyone to study that scoring rubric print it out if that helps you uh, keep going back to it as you're reviewing the questions, you're drafting your responses or drafting your budgets, go back to the scoring scale just to see, have you addressed all of the pieces and parts that, um, that the county will, and city will be looking for. So let's take a look at the questions in the section on the program budget, which is on or starts on page 33 of the RFP. And you'll see that there are two questions, questions 17 and 18. Question 17 refers you to a budget template, which is basically an Excel spreadsheet that you fill out. Um, the spreadsheet includes a budget narrative or description as part of the budget document. So it's not like you have to fill out two separate documents, which is, which is uh, nice. So we'll go over that shortly. Um, uh, when Nicole kind of walks us through what that template looks like, uh, as well as um, the leveraging template. And the one of the updates that the county made last week was just making a, a minor correction in the budget template where the initial Excel spreadsheet that was released had um, some wrong fiscal years <laughs> listed on each tab. And so they have updated that. So uh, if you've already been working in the Excel templates that you downloaded, um, you don't have to worry. Nothing else has changed. It's just those fiscal years. Uh, so here we're showing the question 17 in Spanish. And then question 18 is about leveraging funds and, again, has its own template. Um, this is optional. Um, but potentially worth five bonus points. And again, only applicants in tiers one and two are eligible to complete this leveraging template that can get them those possible bonus points. And then the next slide, again, you'll see that question in Spanish. And Giselle has put a link to, or is going to put a link to the materials and the templates in the chat. The last thing I'll touch on before handing over to Nicole is just um, highlighting a couple of the relevant questions and answers in the document that the county has posted. So there were multiple questions submitted to HSD uh, related to, to program budgets, budget narratives, and leveraging. Um, on this slide here, we just summarized uh, what some of the questions were about. There were some questions really just asking HSD to explain like, when you say things like provide the exact amount of core funding requested, do you mean is that the annual amount or the total amount requested over the three-year period? 
Similarly, when describing the amounts by tiers in the RFP, does that refer to an annual funding amount or the total amount allocated equally over three years? And basically the county's response was the amount that you're requesting or the amounts that you see listed in the RFP uh, across the tiers, that amount reflects um, the amount each year during the three-year funding cycle. And when you're preparing your budgets, the amounts that you're requesting should be the same each year. Um, in the second or the kind of the updated Q&A document that the county posted on July 8th, there were a few more questions related to budgets, but they were very much they were very similar to the earlier questions that were asked. So really the county just confirms that again, the amount you're requesting is the same for all three years. Um, they also confirm that the maximum amount that a single agency can apply for across all tiers and projects is 25% of the $3.79 million that's available in this RFP or the equivalent of $947,500. Um, and it's okay to update if you've been working on the budget and leveraging template it's okay to update the tabs in your own version to match the correct fiscal years. Um, if you don't want to re-download the templates and copy all your, <laughs> all your information over, you can just make the updates directly in your own documents. Okay, I'm going to hand it over now to Nicole to walk through the proposal budgets. Thanks, Nicole. So I'm going to do a quick overview of budgets, proposal budgets in general, and then we'll dive into the specifics of the templates that are required for this core RFP process. And again, just submit questions as we go along in the chat, and we'll have time to address those after we review all this material. So for those of you who are new to proposal budgets, and even those of you who have more experience and are here for a refresher or tune-up, proposal budgets are a really important piece of information for reviewers. Of course, there's a bottom line of how much the proposed project or program is going to cost, but budgets also convey whether those costs are realistic given the objectives and goals that are described in your proposal, whether and how other costs might be covered, and the specific amount that you're requesting from a particular funder. So in this case, the county and city of Santa Cruz relative to, relative to other costs that might be required to successfully launch and implement the activities that you're describing in your proposal. So some typical costs um, include the staff time to implement the activities that you're proposing. In some cases, there might be some other investments and costs attached to them that are required for you to succeed. So maybe you need to train your staff in a new way or provide a coach for them. There might be some extras in your budget that might be on a wish list. For example, maybe you're um, interested in a new piece of software that you believe will make your work more efficient or some other type of equipment that you would love to have but haven't had a chance to purchase yet. You may have some partners involved in your effort and there might be some costs associated with that, with the partnership itself, like hosting meetings or conferences. Maybe you're engaging um, a facilitator for your meetings, or you're supporting some specific aspect of the partner's work that contributes to your own effort, like a portion of an outreach worker's time. So in each of these examples, you'll want to um, make sure that there's a tight connection between the budget items that you've included in your budget and, and the narrative explanation of those with the activities that you've proposed. So the budget is really um, telling the same story that you're telling in the narrative of your proposal, but with, with budget numbers and items. So it's really important to align the budget with the proposed approach. And usually, um, some of you might be in the midst of this at this very moment, your budget is being developed alongside the other parts of your proposal 
So it's normal to expect some adjustments along the way. So for example, you might have an initial target budget. So in the case of the core RFP, you might have an idea about which tier you're applying for. It could be based on some informed estimates, like we have X number of case managers at an annual salary of Y thousand dollars a year. And ideally, you'll be checking in frequently with others who are working on different parts of your proposal to make sure that the budget and the other sections are aligned throughout the process. If you happen to be one of those people who's writing the proposal and preparing the budget, you're just checking in with yourself, which can be easier or harder, depending. But even if that's the case, it's always a good idea to get another pair of eyes on the budget categories to make sure you're not missing anything or raising any eyebrows. And even if you have ultimate responsibility for a budget, you can still get help with pieces of it, like asking someone to help you price out some specific elements like equipment or supplies, what would this really cost? What's an average cost for these? Or getting some estimates about a subcontractor or some partner budgets in a timely way so that you can fold them into your budget. And just uh, a pro tip, don't make the budget the very last thing you do in your proposal process because you don't want any surprises in the budget side of things that will require you to regroup and go back and have to rewrite activities or elim eliminate staff time or something like that in order to get your budget into a certain place. So again, in tandem, the, the budget with the other pieces of your proposal. My computer's not cooperating. Okay, there we go. So let's talk about some common budget categories, like the ones you see on this slide. These are really typical of many proposal budgets, including the core RFP categories. So often um, personnel and fringe benefits are the largest category. In the core RFP, that's a combined item. Um, you might also have a line item for travel. This is um, things like mileage to conduct outreach work. Maybe you're going to a, your staff are going to a conference and there's some costs associated with that. Different kinds of equipment, as we've mentioned, um, supplies that keep things going. Um, maybe you need something that's specific to your project, like you're printing a lot of things or you're taking easels to a uh, uh, health fair or something like that. Then you might have some subcontracts with consultants or your partners to do specific aspects of the work. You might have things that fall into a construction category. And there's always an other category for things that don't quite fit into any of the other line items. So this is where you might see something like stipends or incentives. And then there's also a category that often causes some angst or confusion called indirect charges or general administrative charges. And that's expressed as a percentage of the other categories. It's designed to cover things that are not project specific. So your human resource functions, the accountant who um, helps you with your bookkeeping, the rent that you pay for your whole building. Those are general costs that get allocated across everything you do, but they're hard to tease out in terms of a percentage for a project. And so the solution is to support those kinds of costs because they're completely legitimate, but to do it as a percentage instead of line items. So if you have costs that are really specific to your project, they're gonna fall into one of those line items, but costs that are more general to the operation of your um, organization are gonna be encompassed in that indirect percentage charge. You may have noticed a glossary at the end of the um, core RFP, and there are a couple definitions in there that apply to the budget categories. So one of them is the one I was just talking about, administrative overhead, also known as an indirect rate. And this is just um, explaining in, in their language about the um, cost that you anticipate to support proposed services that can't be readily identified as tied to a project. So the example they've got here is depreciations on equipment or accounting services that are not otherwise identified. 
There's also a definition of braided funding, which is very much what it sounds like, weaving together different funding sources, so federal, state, local, and private funding that supports the quality of your programs. So this is when uh, funding pools, funding streams are brought together for one purpose, but they're still tracked separately. So for example, you're reporting on that funding to different entities. If you see the term blended funding or you're using that term, that requires, um, that, that's when the reporting is also combined as well as the funding streams. The term fiscal year, which is often abbreviated with the letters FY, is used throughout this RFP and many others. So for this particular application, this, it's the fiscal year that the county uses. So that's um, starting July 1st and ending June 30th. So a fiscal year of 2022 to 2023 would specifically be July 1st, 2022 to June 30th, 2023. And this is another place where we can update the years as needed since that time has passed. And then new in this year's RFP is also the leverage funding template, which we'll discuss in just a moment. And that's defined pretty broadly here as using one source of funds to get a commitment from another funding source. And we'll go through that um, template in a moment. Okay, before we dive into the templates, are there any questions so far? Okay, Denise, I see your question about if you wanted to include an independent contractor to do something in your plan, someone coming in weekly to support staff with something, does that go under personnel or contracts in the budget? That's depending on how your contract is set up, that could be in a gray area. Um, if you have, if it's a somebody you consider to be a vendor for a service, even if it's a consulting service, a human being who's coming in to work at your place. If that's somebody who's not on your payroll, um, so they're not receiving benefits, they're not um, included in your staffing org chart, for example, um, I would lean towards leaving that as a, um, a contractual arrangement. So, do, and do you have a contract with that person that spells out their duties and the fees for that? Nicole, Crystal, do you have any different take on that? Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions. Would, yeah, that's how I would interpret it too. Okay, great, thanks. Anybody else so far? There's a question about elaborating more on the match versus leveraging funds, but do you want to maybe hold off on that until you've gone through the leveraging template? Yes, I will. Thanks for that question. Um, and Amy's asking, do we need to create three budgets, one for each fiscal year? Yes, is the answer to that. And well, that's a perfect seg to looking at the budget template, which is set up that way. Well, hold on just a second while I switch from sharing slides. Just sharing the budget time. Um, so as Nicole mentioned, hopefully everyone can see this. It's a little crowded. Can you all see that? Okay. So a couple of things to point out on the very first tab of this. So there are tabs at the bottom. I'm looking at the very first tab that's labeled example. This one is filled out for one fiscal year, 2025 to 2026. And it's for a summer camp program. And it's just an example to illustrate how you could fill out the cells in the subsequent three tabs down here, which are one for each year fiscal year 25, 26, the first year of funding, fiscal year 26, 27, second year, and fiscal year 27, 28, 
third year. So I'm going to go back to the example, but that's how you navigate through this spreadsheet is through these tabs at the bottom. As Nicole mentioned, what's described as a budget narrative is actually a column right here, in this case, column C, that's part of the spreadsheet. So it's not a separate document. Narrative makes it sound like it might be something that's written elsewhere, but it's not. It's, it's an explanation. It's an opportunity to explain each of the numbers that is in the rest of the budget cells. So let's walk through some of these categories. So I mentioned earlier that in this core RFP, salaries and benefits are one number. So that is, in this example, there's half of a full-time equivalent or an FTE for a program director, another half for a social worker, a half for some admin support, and then some temporary camp counselors. So I just want to highlight this here to include the entire personnel cost. So that's salary and any benefits, but you'll be noting what the percentage is, what, what the fringe benefits represent as a percentage of that number in this narrative. So you can see here in each case, they've said, it includes a 35% fringe benefit rate on top of the base salary. So this number, 40,000, is salary and fringe. And here you're explaining what portion of it as a percentage is fringe. You may have prepared other proposal budgets that separate that out, but in this particular case, it's combined. Then there's a category for non-personnel costs, and this has a variety of things within it. So this uh, particular project is buying some equipment, in this case, some laptops, and they're explaining why they need them in the narrative. They're doing some travel and training because the camp is outside the city of Santa Cruz, so they've got some mileage for people. They've, they have to rent the actual campground. So they've got um, that under rent and utilities. And just note that this is because they're renting something that's specific to running this camp. This is not the rent and utilities for their office, for example. So this is specific to the program. That's why it's listed here as a line item. They're not doing any marketing and outreach or at least not requesting funds for that. They don't have any miscellaneous operating expenses, but they do have a professional services line where they're purchasing some liability insurance. Again, that's specific to this camp operation. So it's not the liability insurance for the organization overall. And they, they're going to provide some incentives um, and that's just some welcome packets with, with various items. And they're purchasing some supplies for um, trans transportation and some supportive services. And then they've got a total for all of those non-personnel costs. That's different from the personnel costs above. And then they've got overhead that is calculated as a rate. In this case, it's 4.6%. So they put the rate in the narrative description and they've also listed it here where it's required. So you may have a rate that you're already using, but that's where it goes and that's how you use it. You have a line item for what that is as a percentage of those other costs above. And then you add those together, personnel, non-personnel, and administrative overhead, also known as an indirect rate, to come up with a total. So this program is going to cost $180,573 for all those things. It must be that same amount for each of the three years. But you may still be able to shift. Um, for example, maybe you have different personnel costs in the second year or um, 
equipment costs because you've already bought your laptops, so you don't need that in the second year. You can move things around within the categories, but that number needs to be the same across all three years. And these tabs, again, at the bottom are where you fill that out for each year. It might be the same all three years. It might be a little different, but that grand total is the same. And there are notes and instructions to remind you of what we've just gone over. And you do want to use this narrative description column, column C, to explain to the reviewer whatever you can about those costs, how you've determined them, what, what they're composed of, why you need that thing um, or that service to accomplish your goals. OK, let's. See about questions. Um, and pause, I haven't forgotten you. We're going to get to the leveraging funds next. I'm just scrolling through here. Do you want me to read out a few to, to you, Nicole? I'm sure. saying. Um, so it was a question, do we also include payroll tax slash cost in the personnel total? Hmm. I don't think so. What do you think, Nicole? I... I would, I mean, we can maybe see if the county can give us some mm -hmm. clarification. We can ask that later if it's not already addressed in the Q&A document. But I would, I would read the budget template to mean anything related to personnel is in that personnel section. So if it's. Well, I'm wondering if it's part of how, how you calc, depends maybe on how you calculate your fringe costs, if they're. Mm -hmm benefits and then um, Medicare and social security payments are mm -hmm. as an employee are included in that. So those are payroll taxes. Yeah. I would explore how your fringe cost is calculated as opposed to the straight up salary and see if those payroll taxes are part of that already. They probably are, but we will double check. Um, is mileage included under benefits? Mileage that's specific to conducting the work of the project would be a travel cost. So in the example we just went over with this summer camp, if people are driving outside of the city to work at the summer camp that's miles away, then they're being reimbursed for their mileage and you're requesting that as part of the project. Is there any kind of indirect or overhead admin cap? I believe it's 15%. One five. Find the exact spot where it says that. Um, any other questions before we turn to the leveraging template? Okay, what if you do mileage as a stipend? Um, are you for staff or participants? Uh, for staff. Um, I think that could go in a couple of different places. It makes sense to put it into travel because whether you call it a stipend or a reimbursement, if it's specific to the travel related, mileage related to the conduct of your project activities, that could be a travel line item. I think stipends and incentives typically refer to what, what you're offering to participants. Thank you, yeah, that makes sense. Any thoughts on that? I 
Yeah. And I think probably the more or not more important, but probably the important part would be to um, just make sure that you explain in the budget narrative. So wherever you decide to put it, you know, if you're, if you're providing mileage stipends to staff, instead of doing like a, you know, cents per mile reimbursement, like if, if it's just a different way, that sounds like it would fit under travel and training. And then in your budget narrative, just describe how you, how it is that you uh, are calculating or, or providing those mileage reimbursements. If it's something like it's a program where you're providing a stipend to participants that covers their mileage, but you're treating it like a participant incentive versus like a, a travel line item, that could be fine too. And then again, just make sure you explain that in the budget narrative. I think the kinds of things that will probably raise questions for the reviewers as they're looking at your budgets is if they're seeing something that like doesn't make sense or they're not sure how it ties to your application and like there isn't enough explanation in the budget narrative to help them make sense of it. Like those are the things that um, are probably the things to just kind of keep in mind as you're preparing your budget and the narrative, just thinking about like, you know, when it's a reviewer reading this that doesn't really know the ins and outs of your program, are they going to be able to understand and, and be able to see like, oh yeah, I just read this description of their program, their service, their activities. And so now when I see this budget item appear, that makes sense because it matches up with what they described in the other questions. And I see enough of an explanation in the budget narrative that, yeah, it all makes sense. That's probably the kind of level of um, detail that would be important to, to keep in mind. Um, you know, we can't guarantee <laughs> or make, you know, make any definitive statements about how reviewers will or won't score other than like looking at what are what are they supposed to be considering and scoring? You know, you know their response. Their what is what are they supposed to be using to determine their scores? So that's where you know go back to the scoring rubric and look at okay, what does it say under program budget? They're going to be scoring based on are you using the proper format, the template? Does it span the three years and each year is an equal amount? Budget is clear, free of major errors, like math errors. Does the narrative do an exemplary job showing how the program funds will be spent? And that they're clearly linked to the program activities and outcomes and administrative overhead does not exceed 15%. So my, I read that and and like to me that means okay it's not that the reviewers are going to be judging based on like oh they budgeted something in this line item I don't think it belongs there I'm going <laughs> to give them fewer like they're not going to be making that level it doesn't the scoring rubric doesn't give them that kind of instructions to be um you know making those kinds of judgment calls it's really how clear is your budget and how aligned is it with your descriptions of your programs and activities. And as we mentioned earlier, if you can get another person to eyeball that against your proposal narrative as part of your general review towards the against the scoring rubric as well, it's a really good idea because things that might seem self-evident to you, both in the narrative pros and in the budget numbers um, and explanations might not be to another reader. Um, and there's, there's no limit to how you can explain it in these cells. So, so take the opportunity to make it as crystal clear as you can what supports those numbers. So there might be um, something that might, as, as we've just been discussing, maybe a mileage stipend could belong in this category or, in, or another, and what would make it fit best in a category is how you explain it. I saw a question from Helen about uh, professional services and some subcontractors for things like IT and interpretation and so forth. So if it's project specific, it would belong 
um, in as a subcontract in professional services, or maybe it's something you pay for by the hour and you're anticipating X number of hours for this project event or set of events or sessions. But something like, let's say you had a general IT contract for your agency for when you get that horrible blank screen on your desktop, um, that's not project specific. That might be something that would be absorbed by your administrative overhead um, line item. So just make sure that the things that are in that professional services line item are specific to the activities that you're proposing um, with core funding and are not generic, keep the doors open kinds of things. Okay, let's see, have we caught up with questions? Just wanted to mention a couple of things too. Um, and if you've already draft started working on drafting your budgets, you may have discovered this already, um, but in the cells where you're entering your budget narrative, there's no space limit. I don't think there's a character limit on those, right? <laughs> right, Nicole? And so like, um, Right now, it appears as though each line is pretty, um, you know, limited, but the the cells will expand as you type. And so if you feel like you need to provide more of an explanation and it's, you know, more lines of text or it increases the size of the cell, that's okay. I mean, probably the, it'll help the reviewers if you're, you know, don't write a, if you're also concise, um, just so that it makes it easier for them to read. But I know last time there were some uh, different ways of filling out the budget template where not everyone realized that they could type more text um, in the cells to be able to provide an explanation. So just know that that's an option. And then some of the cells in the budget template have formulas built in. And so it's probably a good idea to click around in the Nicole, it might be a good idea to bring the template back up just to show which cells have formulas so that either you're aware of the calculations or if you end up typing your own number in, just know that you're overwriting a formula and so that it'll be uh, super important to go back then and double check your math and make sure that um, something didn't get thrown off by typing in your own, yeah, your own number. Yeah, it's a great reminder, Nicole, thanks. So all these that have a number in them right here are formulas. Meaning as you as you plunk things into the preceding cells, it'll populate that one. Trying to make it easier, but sometimes if you override them, it can make things harder. You know, it's great to have spreadsheets and have them do all of the math for you, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't eyeball them and check them. You know, just wait a minute. Why is 50,000 plus 100,000 suddenly 200,000 instead of 150? So just that kind of, just the major categories, does anything seem off? You can even do, if you're um, skilled with spreadsheets, you can create some checks for yourself to make sure that things are adding up the way you want them to. Um, and then again, a reminder to make sure that each year is the same. Even if the things within, the things that land you on that number that within those categories are different, that's okay. But the bottom line number you want to be the same. All right, let's turn to the leveraging um, template, which is also um, updated just in terms of the years. So if you've already been filling it out, as Nicole said, with the prior version, don't worry. It's just the, just the numbers related to the three-year periods that have changed. Okay, let me see if I can bring that one up. Okay. So this is the um, this is a new part of the RFP this year, 
And it has to do with um, trying to see where core funding um, is leveraging, in other words, being used alongside with other funds. And it's a pretty broad definition, as you can see here. I'm just going to highlight it here. Please include a description of non-core, in-kind, or cash contributions, including the source of those contributions. If multiple sources are included in one category, please list all sources and amounts in the description. For any non-cash contribution, please include the dollar value equivalent. So you have a lot of discretion here to, to um, say, in this example, the total budget was $180,573,000. The core contribution that's being requested in this particular example is $100,000 but there are other funds that are gonna make up that difference. So in this example, there are some grants from other sources from the state um, and from a community grant program that make up this $35,000 sum that's listed under other funding sources. So you can see there's the amount, where the sub amounts that comprise it, where they came from, the sources, there are some other receivables. So in this case, um, there's some donated items as opposed to donated services, which are below. So there are some donations for this camp of camping equipment. And there's even more detail about sleeping bags, cots and food. And in this example, that, that total of all of that, all of those, um, items and materials and food that are being donated to the program specifically are worth about $5,000. If they'd had to go out and purchase them, that's what it would have cost them. They may have had somebody donating technical assistance, but they didn't, or, or they may have um, had that as part of another funding stream that's relevant to the project. Again, this is not generic stuff. And then, um, there are some volunteer hours that are related to that summer camp program. So in this case, they're they're saying exactly where this number came from. This 4573 is $16 an hour as a minimum wage times the number of volunteer hours, which in this case is 2,536. And so that's how they came up with the additional funds, these that make up the total budget in addition to the core funds they're requesting. So some things about this, again, it includes things that are, somebody's written you a check or, or made a donation, a cash donation to you, or um, in-kind services or goods. Those are all um, things that you can include here. You do need to do this just like the other one for each year. So there are three tabs again at the bottom of the spreadsheet and they're set up the exact same way. There's a total budget at the top. So that's the core contribution, which is the second row here, plus all these other um, funds that help make that project whole. So the, if the core contribution is a portion of your project, just delineate what the other ones are and make sure you have something for all three years. And um, let's see, let's take your questions on those. Do we include fringe benefits to the hourly rate for volunteers? Um, not if you're not paying them, I don't think. What do you think, Nicole? That is a good question. I'm not sure that there's, I'm not sure. <laughs> I feel like that might be a judgment call because if we're talking about the leveraging and you're trying to calculate what, or be able to say in terms of donated services, 
I don't know. Do others of you on the on the on this webinar have a suggestion or a way of doing it? You know, I think um Amy Amy says my guess is no, it's a fictitious payment in the first place. Mm hmm. So, yeah, here's what here's what I would say. There's nothing in the scoring rubric or this template that says. The leveraging has to be a certain proportion, like um, I think earlier we saw the term match. You're not requested to have 25 percent of your funds or 50 percent of your funds or any percentage of your funds in these categories at all. So. Um, there's nothing about the um, the proportion of them. So I don't think you need to stretch them um, in that way with the, you know, for example, the fictitious fringe benefits on top of the fictitious minimum wage. But you're saying that you're saying there is a value to these services um, that people are donating and you want to have some basis for that. So you're you're saying it's you're going to use minimum wage. If you want to use something different as the basis for that go right ahead, but explain it, explain it in that narrative description. But I don't think you need to, I don't think you need to reach an, a threshold of some kind. It just needs to pass a reasonable test. And Denise, I see your hand up. Let me just address a couple related questions that also just came up about um, what if, and this is a very likely scenario probably, in, in let's say you have some stuff lined up for the first year, but you know for sure that those funds are going to be um, flowing from your other funders, for example, in years two and three. I think you have to be candid about that and just say, you know, that you will request them in the narrative description, say anticipated and requested, but not confirmed or something like that. But it would be helpful if you had something in each year, even if it's an in-kind um, that you that you do think you can count on. I, I don't think it's reasonable to expect you to see three years into the future about what you might get, but you can explain what you're seeking. I think, again, in a reasonable way. Okay, Denise, what's your question? Nicole, can I add to that before you yes, move on? Because um, in the leveraging template, it's, I mean, it's a spreadsheet, but it's not like the dollar amounts have to add up to a certain thing or that there's a formula that, and so really you could like treat those as text boxes where you're, um, you know, if you need to say like label something as confirmed amount and then you enter an amount or projected or, <laughs> you know, anticipate or however you want to label it, um, you know, probably more again, the like Nicole said, passing the reasonable <laughs> test that just to, you know, to kind of ask yourself, like, you know, how um how true or accurate does it seem? Would you be able to explain it? Would you be able to um explain how you arrived at those numbers? That's I think really what this template is asking for. And so use your use those cells, use your narrative description in however, whatever way you feel it'd be helpful to, again, make it clear to the reviewer, you know, what, what those numbers represent and where those came from. Um, and again, looking at the, at the scoring rubric for that item on leveraging funds, uh, you might notice that that one is a little bit different from the other scoring items where it's either a score of zero the applicant does not provide leveraging information and or does not provide leveraging information for all three years of the funding period and or the description of leveraging is incomplete or it's a score of five that you've completed the template describes the leverage funding source for each year of the funding source and so the <laughs> it's yeah so Interpret that as you will in terms of like what level of detail uh, you need to provide. Thanks, Nicole. Um, Denise, you've been so patient. And then I also see another question. Go, go ahead. 
Yeah, um, so we have different departments that are applying for core funding, and we both may be applying for support for, we have a food pantry program. Um, so on our leveraging and on our budget, should we be teasing out what each department uses of that and leverages, or should we both use the total for what we get? Let's say like for our food pantry program, we get a donation of food. Should we both be giving that total on our leveraging and on our budgets, or should we be teasing out, depending on the program? Does that make sense, my question? I think the more project specific you can be, okay, better. Um, it's hard to say without seeing the exact yeah. scenario. Okay. We could do it by like how many food bags are provided to each department maybe, and then using that formula to break stuff up. Yeah. Again, it doesn't, the amount doesn't matter here. It's that you have something there. Okay. Thanks. Um, I think that's the most defensible myself, but Nicole, Crystal, thoughts? I think just that whatever method you decide to go with that again, that you're explaining that in the narrative description Because depending on which we don't we don't like we don't even know at this point how the proposals will be handed out to the reviewers and whether they'll be reviewing, you know, whether someone will review proposals from the same agency that are for different programs. So to, you know, I was just kind of thinking about, okay, if I don't know who the reviewers are, I'm gonna assume that they don't know much about my program <laughs> and assume that if they see things that uh, look identical across applications that I should probably explain, like if there's, you know, so that, like, so that again, it doesn't leave them with questions that make them um, think that, the, you know, that make them question the numbers or the explanations. Yeah, it's a good, good rule of thumb for all of these. Um, there are a couple questions about the total budget and core contribution rows here. So one question is the budget total, the entire program budget amount, not only for the core funded activities. And then if they, another question is if the requested amount and total leverage funds does not add up to the total budget amount, does it matter for the core grant? Since this is a situation where you're still actively working on raising and requesting funds. Yes. Yeah, so, um, it may be that you have a core request and you have some other funding sources and you still have maybe something that's from your internal operating funds that supports the project. So it may not perfectly line up, but this is asking for non-core sources of funding that support the program that you've just described in your whole proposal. So yes, this total budget, if, if you're filling out this template, if this applies to you, um, your total budget amount will be larger than the core contribution. Because what you're saying by filling this out is that you are um, seeking core funds, but there are other funds and donations and support that make this project possible and core is an important piece of that, but it's not the only piece of it. So yes, there should be um, a core contribution that's um, amplified by these other funding streams and donations. Therefore, the total budget amount will be larger. Um, there's another question about, then this is the, the definition of leveraging funds, you're right, is, um, the term leveraging implies that there's something that is a, a boost, like you, in order to um, get these other funds, you have to have maybe a, you know, a local funding source in order to get a state or federal grant, for example. And then this could count as that local funding source and therefore make you eligible to draw down these other funds. That is technically leveraging. It's not the specific definition that's that's being used in the scoring rubric or in this leveraging template. So um, 
the leveraging template definition is much broader than that. It's just a description of non-core in-kind or cash contributions. There's nothing about, are they required? Are they a match? Are they a certain amount? They're just in the mix in some way alongside the core funding that you're seeking. Does that help? Um, there's a question to me privately in the other spreadsheet, the one for your core project funds. Let me go back to that one. So this spreadsheet that has the example from the camp on the first tab with personnel costs that include salaries and benefits and then non-personnel costs and the indirect or administrative overhead and ask you for those same categories for each year. The question is on this budget template, the budget and narrative that are combined here, is it just for the core funding? Yes. This one is just core. The leveraging one is the opportunity to say core is part of a bigger picture. And here's what that bigger picture is all about. Here are the elements of it, cash or in kind. And as Nicole said, if there's something that feels um, murky or puzzling to you, it probably is to somebody else. So just make sure you explain it. Explain it in this narrative description column or in the leveraging template in the description of the sources of the funds and how you have calculated, for example, an in-kind donation. You have a lot of latitude there, but use the latitude to be clear as clear as you can. Yes, the example is confusing because the 180K in the original budget is then the larger budget in the leveraging template. So just ignore that for now. Uh, I'm sorry, a, a question. Yes. Since we include the total, it's going to be over the 20%, the per minute. If you include your overhead, yes, the overtime. Don't know my overhead. The leverage plus the request for the core. Oh, you're not, but you're not requesting the leveraged amounts. Okay. Yeah, the the core amount is what you're requesting. Uh -huh. On the leveraging, there are additional donations and um, funds funds from other sources that support your project that are not part of the 25%. All right. Thanks. Just the core part is. You're welcome. Danu? Hi, yeah, I'm sorry. Can So can you say this again? Because this is kind of contrary to what I was interpreting. So the grand total on the budget for each year, that grand total piece, that is supposed to be the percentage of the overall program that will would be funded by core dollars and not the grand total of the cost of the program for which core is funding a portion. Does that make sense? Yes. So um, so let's say we're we're reviewers of this proposal for camp opportunity. Our understanding from this budget is camp opportunity is asking us for $180,573. I'm gonna share my screen again. Oops, wrong one, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, I've got it open twice. <laughs> Let's try this one more time. Okay, there it is. The Camp Make a Difference Summer Camp is asking for core funding of this amount, 18573. 
And that 18573 is going to cover all of the things listed here, half of the program director, half of a social worker, half admin support, et cetera. So let's let's ignore that that 18573 happens to appear as the grand total in the leveraging budget. So just set that aside for now. This is the 180 that we're requesting from CORE for the summer camp. It's possible that the program is actually a $250,000 program because maybe it's a full-time social worker and we're only asking for half from CORE. And maybe there are temporary camp counselors that are being funded through the CORE project, but we also have another local philanthropic grant that's supporting another set of camp counselors. Those other things, other, other costs, other donations, other funding, those are the things that show up on the leveraging template. This one, the number that has your bottom line that you're requesting from CORE is just CORE. So, and it's the same each year. And so if you're successful, this is what core investments would be granting to you for your to operate this program. Whether you have an extra $10 in your leveraging budget or an extra $100,000 in your leveraging budget. This is the this is the core amount. Okay, I think I have it. So then if this is uh, a large, if this program costs, you know, 200,000 to put on each year, then we're talking about a piece of the pie, <laughs> which is potentially even a piece of your greater pie of, of your overall program costs. Okay. Yes. And I think, I, I think part of the confusion is that in the template, they use the same number, 185.73 for the grand total and said that the core request was a hundred thousand of that. Yes, that was confusing. Yeah, thank you. Um, so let's let's try to undo that confusion and say that these are two separate, completely separate examples. They just happen to both be about a camp and have this number appear twice. But so so just to clarify, the the core budget and narrative are core core expect what what you expect to cover with your core grant. Leveraging template is core plus whatever else you've got coming in, in kind or cash to support that very same program that you've described in your activities. Does that help? Yes, that is really helpful, thank you. And maybe- yeah. Nicole, can I share my screen for just a second? Because it is kind of confusing. <laughs> I'm glad that you pointed out that that really, I think what you're what you're saying, and and we'll double check again with HSD to, and they might actually even issue another addendum if this is if that really was an error. That really this line here in the leveraging template where it says core contribution, that number should be the same as the grand total in the budget template, because that is what you're requesting from core. And then if you added up all these other funding sources, the total program budget would be higher. It'd be 61,146. And just to clarify, Nicole fixed this herself just now. Yeah. This is not a document that anyone else has right. seen. In case you're wondering what you've missed, this is probably what it should should say. We will confirm that. Yeah. Um. And um. It's very likely that your program would have something else coming in, but it's it's. I'm seeing some nodding from those of you who are on camera, but it's it's likely that. The core funding is not going to cover everything that you're doing in your program. And so it's reasonable 
to think about the leveraging template as an opportunity to explain that fuller picture of how your program exists or is operating with other things supporting it, whether it's in kind or cash. So if that helps to think of it as, and thank you, Crystal, for that um, framing. If, if, it's, if it helps to think of it as there's this core budget and request that is all about just what the core funding is gonna cover. And then there's this opportunity that's called the leveraging template that lets you say, thank you, we love to have core funding, but we also have these other things in play. And here's how they would support that. That's where you can make that, paint that picture. It may be a small amount, it may be a large amount, that's entirely up to you. But um, just as Nicole said, look again at that scoring rubric or guide and make sure that you've got all three years covered and that your explanations of whatever's coming in or whatever you've planned or are seeking is as clear as it can possibly be. Okay, Denise, back to you. Should we just be noting the stuff that supplements what we're asking CORE for to do? Because some of us have very large programs, but we're asking CORE to specifically help fund particular things within that program. So I'm wondering if I should be, you know, on my leveraging, should I be showing the entire program budget or should I just show the things that relate to what I'm asking CORE to help with? If that makes sense. It does. I, I think that's a decision that only okay. you can make, but there is a lot of guidance in the scoring guide to keep things tightly bound to the proposed activity yeah. projects. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was reading too. I just wanted to check. Thanks. So to clarify, CORE is only concerned with costs associated with the grant requests. We do not show anywhere the details to the total cost of the project. No, you may show the total cost of the project. Um, for example, you could show that on the leveraging um, template if it's appropriate. You also may want to describe that in your narrative you might explain that you're, as part of your uh, making the case for why you need core funding to do what you've proposed to do, you might explain how it augments, expands, strengthens, whatever your existing program. So there are a couple of ways to do that if, if the core costs are just covering a particular aspect of your program. Nicole, Crystal, anything to add there? Just that I think um, <laughs> see if I can say this in a way that doesn't create more confusion. Like for your grant proposal, you're going to be described. You're going to be you're you're requesting funds for a program or project. Uh, for some of you, that may represent in the way you describe your program or project and then the way you, you know, fill out your budget template. For some of you that like your core proposal for this program or project may be the same as the way you think about your program in your agency. Like it's just one and the same thing and you're requesting just a portion of the funding from core for this kind of bigger program. Um, and so when you get to the leveraging template and it's asking for the total program budget, for some of you, it may make sense to provide the whole program budget and then show what portion of, you know, that here's your core request and then here's where all the other funding is coming from. Um, and then just explain that, like, this is your total program budget. This is, you know, what it takes in, in its entirety to operate this program and that you're requesting this proportion from core. Here's where the rest of it comes from. Others of you may be crafting your application 
and and really defining your program or project for this core grant really as like its own program or project that may be like still a subset of a of a bigger program but it's like the way you're defining your program or project may be a really defined and distinct thing and so as long as you're like describing it in a consistent way in, in your application responses in your budget and your budget narrative, then in your leveraging template, if you are using it, your total program budget might be, might represent um, something that's not quite as <laughs> big as a whole program budget. And hope that doesn't uh, make things more confusing, but I just want to acknowledge that like some of you may be kind of thinking about and interpreting even just the word program and project slightly differently depending on your situation. And so I think that's where we go back to just make sure you, you've you explained that you're using consistent, that you're using consistent terminology and explanations throughout your application. So that then again, when you get to the budget, budget narrative, leveraging templates, um, that it doesn't all of a sudden cause a reader to go, wait, what does that mean? And why is this, this, you know, and kind of create that reaction of like, this doesn't make sense or it seems really different from what you've said in earlier in your proposal. So it's really about kind of what we're talking about through proposal budget into leveraging. If you're focused on these, the subset of your program that core is going to fund, or if you're talking overall, we want support with our program with core funding, and it's going to help with all the things we do, and then it would show in the budget, and it would show in the leveraging. Okay, thank you. Great summary, thanks. All right, we are nearing the end of our time together, so I'm going to move us on. Um, but thanks for all the great questions and for being patient as we walk through these together. So, Nicole, you want to pitch the the last core RFP training? Sure. We have uh, one more training coming up this Friday, and really, it's just going to be some highlights from all of the trainings we've done so far. Just kind of so for anybody that either missed uh, any of the trainings and wants a, a little bit of a you know kind of a taste of each one, or maybe you attended one but are still feeling like wait. What was that? <laughs> what, how do I go about this? It's just a kind of a refresher. And so really what it means is we'll have a lot of time for, I think we'll have a lot of time for any kind of lingering questions or um, yeah, discussion as you're getting closer to the end stages of your proposal writing. So if you haven't yet signed up for it, uh, feel free to register for that now. Um, we are also still posting, I think we have a little bit of catch up to do to get all of the recordings and the slides from all the trainings onto the core resources website. Um, but those will all, all be available in case you want to, again, go back and review things on your own. Uh, we do want to ask for your feedback about today's training session. It'll help us again to know what worked well and, and uh, what could use improvement. So please, please, please. Fill out the feedback survey using uh, one of the links in the chat, or if you have a sm smartphone handy, you can scan the QR code and get to it that way. And I think we, that's probably it in terms of the slides. Again, if you are um, still in need of the individualized TA sessions, maybe just so I can post that link one more time in the chat. Uh, and then if you haven't already gotten on our on our schedules, we'll see what we can um, work out or fit in for you. And mm -hmm. then Helen, I see the question about um, the link to the July 8th responses to questions. And Gisela, I think has that posted earlier. If you could post that again, there we go. And so in that Q&A document, uh, it's basically a combination of the questions and responses that were posted on June 21st and then July 8th. And so the newer things are highlighted in yellow so that you can see um, 
what additional questions came in. Some of them are very similar to the questions that were posed earlier. And so that you'll see that there weren't any new responses, just kind of the acknowledgement that additional questions came in. Other times you'll see that there are new or additional responses that were added. And we'll stay on for a little bit longer in case anyone has uh, lingering questions they want to ask or didn't get a chance to ask during our Q&A. But if you feel like you got everything you needed, then you are welcome to log off. And again, please, please, please fill out the feedback survey and good luck to all of you.